So I'll just share my screen here. Okay. Excellent. So today's webinar, ladies and gentlemen, is all about treats. So it's hard to live with them, but we definitely cannot live without them. So another question, very controversial deliberately, um, that we've put in to discuss at the end is, should support practitioners prevent people supported from having treats? Um, it's probably against the human rights, but I um, thought it'd be a good, a good topic of discussion. Um, we we'll go for the extreme end of one argument. And uh, another extreme one, should treats be banned from the office? So I will fully disclose that um, I'm not suggesting you should. I'm just uh, merely um, trying to stoke a bit of an emotional reaction. Hopefully I'll have a whole chat about that at the end. But it's an interesting concept to think about um, from a health and safety perspective long term. So today's focus, if you want to help the people that you support to lose weight, feel better, and massively reduce their risk of preventable illness, this is the webinar for you. Like I said, I think if there's one topic to talk about, this is it, because this is the, the big um, main barrier, I think, that holds people back ultimately. And if you want to lose weight, feel and perform better, and massively reduce your risk of preventable illness, then this webinar is for you as well. So what's to come? We're going to talk about what are treats, why do we need them, um, why do we need to manage them, and how can you manage them and help the people you support to manage them as well. So first of all, what are treats? Treats are all the good stuff. <laughs> everything that you enjoy um, is, is not absolutely everything, but the majority of things that you enjoy, sweets, savoury snacks, alcohol, um, anything you're going to get when you're eating out really is probably considered a, a treat. And when we think about the health by science plate, where we've got a lot of protein, vegetables, uh, and a controlled amount of carbs and fats, um, we would consider a treat as anything kind of outside of this plate, if you like. That's not to say that these plates can't taste amazing and feel like a treat, but a treat is something that we it isn't really offering us much nutritionally. And typically these are ultra processed foods. They're foods that they're manufactured in a way to make them very palatable and very Moorish, which we'll talk about later. They're typically poor quality. Um, they're not made to improve the quality of our nutrition. Sometimes they're fortified with vitamins and minerals to give us the impression that they are um, quality, but, but they're definitely not. Um, and really we eat them mainly because they make us feel good and that's really important um, but also just because they're they're convenient and sometimes we'll eat treats not necessarily because we um they, they taste amazing but it's more because they're there and it's convenient and it saves us time we'd have to think in our busy lifestyles so are treats bad we often get guilt tripped into thinking that certain foods are bad and certain foods are good but we really do not buy into that or do not, do not promote that. There's no such thing as good food or bad food. Um, it, it, the, re, the rationale is that, so the reality is that the poison is in the dose. Obviously, we don't want to have too many treats. We're going to put on weight and it's going to ma massively affect our health. But a nutrition or, or a diet that doesn't have any treats is definitely not good. You know, you're really going to, if you think about the, an extreme example of um, bodybuilders who deliberately try and get extremely low body fat so they don't have any treats, they, someone might bite my head off saying this, but the, you know, it's much harder for them to, to, to socialize and interact. You know, when you go out and meet friends, when you go to social events, you, know, you can do it for sure, but it is much harder. You have to have very, very strong motivation in order to not engage and have, you know, a glass of wine or you know um a, a few extra carbs or a dessert now and again so that's not realistic for most people and it's certainly not enjoyable for, for the majority of people and the optimal amount is about 20 percent we'll come to what that actually looks like a bit later on so really treats are great but you just need to learn what that moderation is and this is not a topic we talk about or hear about um, we just know that we should manage 
output and that's not always very useful <laughs> so before we get into management why do we actually crave ultra processed foods well when we eat these amazing foods and, and drinks it gives us a nice reaction in our brain and more specifically what happens is we eat the food the stomach breaks it down if we use pizza for an example and then the small intestine detects the nutrients in chime and it produces this surge in dopamine it's this dopamine response that that has that moorish rewarding sensation uh, mentally this exact same dopamine response we get when we get a notification on our phone so facebook instagram make all their money based on this little chemical reaction in that when you see a notification or someone likes your post or says happy birthday you get a nice little buzz and you go back for more and that if that's positive that gets reinforced and so the next time um, you want to boost you might think about um, pizza or if you see pizza that might trigger that craving and all ultra processed foods do this you know that they are kind of um, whether they were originally designed for that or, or not that's what that's why they they do so well that's why they're so um they're so abundant in our society and typically the things that actually make them um very moorish and make us crave them is the combination of sugar fat and salt and the ideal combination of sugar and fat is actually 50 50 some interesting research on donuts and the best donuts which sell well are the ones that are exactly 50 percent sugar and 50 percent fat but obviously it varies between them some people prefer more savory so more fat less sugar and other people prefer more sugar less fat so for example maybe something like sweets or or chocolate and that's why they taste so good. You know, that's why we think about them. That's why we often, um, it's an easy decision to make if they're there and we fancy it because we know it's going to make us feel good for a short period of time. So why are they important? They're important because we use them to celebrate. When it's someone's birthday, we, you know, we, we get the treats out. When we're socializing with friends or catching up, we go out for meals and we get the treats out. When we're feeling sad, so, you know, people will often um bias treats or we uh or we buy them for ourselves to give us a little boost whether it's a takeaway or um you know something from greg's or whatever it all gives us a reward that makes us feel good and improves our mood and makes life a little bit better but unfortunately that doesn't last very long and ultimately we go back to the way we were feeling before but also a little bit um at higher risk of weight gain if we if we do that continuously and it's so ingrained in our society it's impossible to try and separate you know live a life without treats like i said it's so emotional we're so emotionally connected to them um it's just part of the, our way of life we need to learn to, to live with them and companies know this better than anybody and they really tap into our emotions so here's an example from mcdonald's um, and about how they are using more emotion to tap into a reason why we should buy McDonald's rather than anything to do with actual food. Okay, so that advert has nothing to do with food. But what they're doing is they're tapping into their target market, people that are single, perhaps um, maybe looking for a, for a partner and they share something in common. So this is like the clever little tactics that are used in marketing. This has been going on for years and Roses use it um, for their classic advert. Roses, their favorite centers, all lavishly covered in delicious Cadbury's chocolate. Make roses the sweetest way to say thank you very much. You're one in a million. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much for feeding William. Thank you very, 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 very. Say it with Cadbury's roses. 
love those old adverts. But as you can see, again, nothing to do with roses, it's to do about saying thank you. And the recent example for, for me, uh, me and my partner moved into um, our home, which was great. And the amount of gifts we got was awesome, including this uh, Colin the Caterpillar little goodie bag, um, which we're still devouring at the moment. So it happens all the time and we don't even think about it, but treats are absolutely everywhere. And yes, we did eat all of the Colin uh, Caterpillar. So the, not that companies are sinister, but the way our society has developed for whatever reason, <clears throat> it has meant that about 50% of our diets are ultra processed food. And this is not good basically. And so it's about how can we swing that balance back again? And if you look at your, your grandparents, they had a much better relationship with treats probably because they weren't so abundant. You know, having a cake at birthday was probably a big deal. Um, and especially during the war with rations, it, it was a massive deal. And so providing people with treats was a really good way of, of showing that you cared and you're willing to sacrifice your own treats to give it to other people. Um, and that kind of behavior has continued um, on on steroids really because treats are everywhere um so that is is getting treats is not scarcity anymore it is it's an abundance and gone to the other extreme and this has meant that we it often outweighs our shopping list and a, and a good analogy we like to use is um your treats being a bit like uh, your money and this is not a perfect um similarity but it is it's good enough for this example if you think about, you know, if you spend as much as you earn, then you have no change. Or if you eat the number of calories that you burn, then your weight will stay stable and you won't put on weight, you won't lose weight. And treats is really like spending your money on things that you don't really need, but, but you enjoy them. And that's really important. Like we said before, you living your life without spending any money is not, is not good. You know, it's important to spend money to visit places, see things, socialize, engage in society and live life. But equally, there's a line in the sand. You can't, you don't want to spend too much on your fans holidays and, and get yourself into debt because um, you're going to have to pay, pay that back. And so just like with, with our, our finances, where we don't want to spend too much, we have to pay that back. We, but it's important to spend some treats is exactly the same in that we, you know, a good lifestyle is not um, without treats, but if we have too many that we can get into debt and ultimately end up putting on more weight. But if we have a good relationship with treats and we manage that balance, we have a good quality of life. If we don't, if we overexpend on our treats and our calories consumed is very high, then it will lead to weight gain and like being in debt in terms of a nutritional perspective. And unfortunately, for the general population, this means a poorer quality of life and a poorer life quality with disability um, free life expectancy of just about 60 years old instead of um, instead of much, much higher, like it could be about 80, 80 years old. And ultimately, if you know, if you want to get your your life curve in a, in a more positive trajectory, then we need to pay pay those treats back if you like and, and rein, rein things in a little bit until we get a better balance. And again, that means saving the pennies, saving the treats, making sure that we're preserving the treats when it really matters and when it really counts and trying to avoid spending them on things we don't really care about. And if you do that, we can increase the calories that we burn and that can improve our life curve, our quality of life, and we just live a much better life as a result of that. But this is difficult because life is complicated and we live in a society that means it's very, very easy to overeat. So we're not saying that treats should be banned, not at all. Treats should be enjoyed, like we said before, in, in moderation. And so if we can swing this balance from 50% ultra processed to better quality food to about 80-20, then we can live a really good, high quality uh, of life at a healthy weight. So if we look at this in, in real terms, if somebody eats, say, three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 
then that's the equivalent of having 28 good quality meals and seven meals a week that might be poorer quality. You can get away with that. That's fine. It's not black and white treats or no treats. It's about understanding that you want the majority of your nutrition to be good quality and really savor the treats that you want and save the things you want to spend that kind of allowance on if you like so why do we find this so hard you know, in principle it's quite it's quite straightforward well we might have seen this before but this is the obesity system map and it's really complex and for anyone that tries to oversimplify weight loss is energy in versus energy out um they just don't know what they're talking about because this is the, the reality of why weight loss is hard and we've got lots of different factors here the media social factors psychological factors economical factors food activity infrastructure development biological and medical now these here can all be positive or negative biological tends to be positive and the medical tends to be a negative influence and if we zoom in at Oh, sorry, if we categorize those a bit more, you can see that these are the big societal influences, food production, food consumption, individual psychology, individual activity, activity environment, and our biology. These are all interlinked in some way, and it creates this complex system of why people struggle. There is no one magic pill that we can use in order to solve this issue. So if we zoom into our food production area, you can see how all these factors like pressure on job and the economy, pressure for growth and profitability, the desire to maximize volume, the pressure to cater for acquired tastes, um, how these all influence things like the demand for convenience, food variety, alcohol consumption, our tendency to craze. And these all influence ultimately our dietary habits, um, which at the moment, <clears throat> unfortunately for most people, means weight gain. Um, and, and being overweight. The key thing to remember here is that one feast isn't the problem. So one big meal or, or you know one big set of treats isn't the issue. It's the accumulation of treats that is the issue. So here we have some interesting research um, based on the yearly weight change in Germany, Japan, and the US. And I know the UK and Scotland isn't there, but uh, I think it's safe to say that we're pretty similar to, to Germany and the US in terms of our culture. And you can see how it's the big seasonal holidays that cause these spikes in our weight. So generally speaking, around August, September, there's no exact reason for that spike, but you could probably safe to assume that a lot of people go on holiday at this period. So there's a little uh, spike in weight. And then people tend to lose weight as it gets down towards Christmas. But when Christmas comes along, we see this big bump in our weight and then we struggle to lose it again. By the time Easter comes around, it spikes again. In Japan, it hits their golden wheat, you can see it spikes. So although the timings are slightly different in terms of the cultures, there's a, there's a clear pattern that when there's a, there's a holiday season, something to celebrate, um, treats are involved and we tend to over consume but unfortunately these come thick and fast and so it's the accumulation of these treats that that causes the issue so what can you do to manage your treats better well a useful way to think about it is like your brain being a bit like an elephant and a rider and that sounds a bit crazy but bear with me so there's two parts to your brain there's the, the rider, and this is the kind of logical uh, part of your brain that acts on thoughts, analysis, it requires direction, clarity, it gets stuff done. And it's the thinky part of our brain. When we, when we stop to concentrate, we're using our rider. But the rider's quite weak in that you can't think about everything all the time. It's the reason we feel tired at the end of the day. It's the reason we feel if you've had a stressful day at work, you feel exhausted because you're tiring the ride around. The elephant is the more emotional part of our brain. And that's, that acts on impulse, habits, it likes stories, um, and it's very, very strong. So this is the things that we do without even thinking about it. When, um, you're, when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth without even thinking about it, 
that's your elephant. You don't have to think your way through brushing your teeth, you just do it. And so it's really important, this part of the brain, because it means that we don't have to uh, think about everything all the time. But unfortunately, the, these habits can be a loyal servant, but they can also be a tyrannical master, especially when it comes to treats. But we also have the path that the elephant, the rider go on, and we can shape this. So that's kind of how a much simplified version of that obesity uh, system map. And so the, like I said before, the, the three things we can do is to strengthen your rider, train your emotional elephant, and shape your path that you, that you travel along. So let's start off with strengthening your rider. So the th first thing to understand is that you really shouldn't um, focus your energy on using exercise to manage your treats. Often people think, well, I can eat that because I did this exercise. Really not a good idea because it's just not fair on yourself. <laughs> if you can't outrun uh, or out exercise a bad diet because abs, as they say, are made in the kitchen. In, in, when you look at the amount of calories we burn each day, only about 30% is from movement and, and exercise. Most of it comes from just being alive, from our brain working and our body organs. And if you think about a chocolate bar, if you want to burn that off, it's like running for 30 minutes. You know, running for 30 minutes is a huge achievement, um, completely disproportionate to how easy it is just to not back a chocolate bar. And the same for a glass of a glass of wine. You might have a casual glass of wine, um, and, and someone might think, "Well, I'll enjoy that because I went for uh, the gym." It will completely negate it. So exercise is brilliant, but it's not a great strategy for for controlling treats, especially on its own. One of the most powerful things you can do is to improve your awareness of what you're actually doing. So even just that one thing, don't try and change anything, just increase your awareness and track what you're doing. And the ones we like to use are my fitness pal, but you can use pen and paper, or you can use things like meal logger, um, where you just take photos of your, of your nutrition. And this allows you to think about your eating habits. And there's some really interesting research which looks at this. So if you think about how self-monitoring affects your weight, and this bearing in mind, this is people that, they didn't actually try to change anything. They just monitored what they were doing. So it's just engaging that thinking part of the brain, which automatically just makes you make different decisions. And that doesn't mean that you're restricting yourself. It just means that you, you might reduce the number of treats that you, you just don't need, you don't really care for, you were doing it out of habit. And so here we can see during the holiday weeks, we know that um, people typically um, put on weight, but the people that um, self-monitor, they're much more likely to be able to lose weight if they're self-monitoring. And on the non-holiday weeks, the majority of people lost weight simply by monitoring what they were doing. And again, you can see pre-holiday, during the holiday and post-holiday, those people that just monitor what they're doing perform much better in terms of their, their weight change than those who mindlessly eat um, things they don't really care for. Again, I will reiterate, the people that are self-monitoring that are losing weight, they're still having treats. They're still enjoying themselves. They're still engaging in the holiday. They're just more aware of what they're doing and they're making slightly different decisions. And that is extremely powerful. So the good thing to ask yourself is, um, do 80% of your meals look like this? Because if they don't, and that's a, a a good place to, to start and think. When you sat down for a meal, ask yourself these three questions. Where are my veggies? Where's my protein? And do I need carbs? Because although you might think of treats like wine and chocolate and cake, treats are also just portions we don't need. So would, would you rather enjoy that glass of wine or have that extra portion of rice and potatoes? It's a similar sort of thing. The, the energy is the same. We want to make sure that your main meals are really good quality and are balanced and save your treats for your social events and the things that you actually really care about. And so these three questions are key whenever you're uh, sitting down to eat. Another thing we can do is focus on eating, um, sorry, with that plate, 
by following the plate, you're focused on eating more, not less. Often we think of managing treats as, um, you know, taking things away and restricting ourselves. That's not, that's not the case. You don't have to restrict yourself um, to the point where you're not eating any treats. All we're saying is be mindful of all the extra treats you're having that you don't really care for and save the treats for ones that you really enjoy and savor. And so that's why we have it in the health by science plate is protein and vegetables. If we can focus on eating more of the protein and vegetables, then you're going to feel like you are getting a lot of food, but it's going to fill you up much quicker and for much longer. So if it is Christmas time, if you're full of protein and vegetables and fiber, you can still enjoy your treats, but you're less likely to crave treats because you're going to feel much fuller from the protein and the fiber from all the vegetables that you're eating. The next one, and this is probably one of the biggest ones, is practice eating mindfully. So we know that even just from people that eat slowly, um, deliberately slowly, they are, the, the fast eaters, 115 uh, percent more likely to be obese just from deliberately eating slowly and again that's about engaging the thinking part of your brain deliberately uh, focusing on your food rather than letting yourself be distracted and next we can learn to ride craving waves so where do cravings come from again just to remind us we cravings can come from feeling guilty or or ashamed maybe because of eating or it could be from anything we might feel burnt out and tired. We might be sleep deprived. We might feel stressed. We might feel sad and depressed. And this, these can often lead as a, be a trigger to binge eating because we know that these foods give us a positive kick. So when we're feeling these negative emotions, if we've used them in the past successfully to boost our mood, then it will reinforce that behavior because we get that surge in dopamine that makes us feel good then whenever we feel sad, we crave it again. And when these foods are really abundant and everywhere, it becomes very easy to overeat and accumulate those, those treats because it makes us feel good, but only for a short period of time. And unfortunately, this also leads to weight gain, which leaves us worse off than when we started. And if you're interested in learning more, if you feel like you struggle with your cravings, um, or somebody you know or a person support struggles with their cravings then then goeatrightnow.com is a really good uh, mindfulness based app that we use with clients um, who struggle with the emotional side of eating they find that their their nutrition is actually very well controlled in terms of breakfast lunch and dinner but they find themselves overeating with snacks because of their emotions and they find that really hard to to, to manage and Go Eat Right Now is a brilliant way to educate yourself and, and strengthen the rider and stop beating yourself up, basically. And it's about riding the crave wave. Is This is one exercise that they, they would use because cravings are light waves. They come and they can be big, they can be scary, and they often come in sets. There's one thing you can guarantee is that you're going to get a craving. So the key thing is not to beat yourself up about it and make yourself feel bad if we can learn to be mindful and accept these things, then we can learn to ride the crave waves and not be at the mercy of our, of our emotions all the time. So that's the best way to, to strengthen your rider. And um, if you think you struggle with your cravings, then I strongly recommend that app. It's really good and it's, it's pretty cheap as well. So the next step is to train your emotional elephant. So, the first thing is, like I said before, to stop beating yourself up. If you're struggling with your treats, understand that most of Scotland struggles with this. You know, more than two thirds of the population are overweight or obese. And that's not a deliberate choice for the vast majority of people. That's because um, it's, it's difficult to manage treats and they, uh, it's very easy to, to overeat in our, uh, in our culture. So don't beat yourself up. Understand that motivation is very changeable. So you need to make it easy for yourself. You know, your, the emotional part of your brain, like we said before, is, is very powerful. And the motivation, the sort of thinky part of your brain 
is not very strong. It's quite weak. So you might feel very motivated for a short period of, for, for a period of time, and you might be able to do something hard, like stick to an extreme diet. But the reality is that your, your rider, the thinking part of your brain is going to get tired, especially when life happens and you're stressed from other things. And when motivation dips, you've, you've got no chance. You want to stay on this side of the action line for the behavior to be consistent. And so you need to understand that motivation is, is changeable. It's nothing to do with your willpower. It's to do with life happening. And um, you just need to accept that. So the way to get around that is to make it easy for yourself. So when motivation is low, we want to make it easy to do. And that's why we always say, focus on one small, easy habit at a time. Because you can do it the hard way, but you need to be super motivated all the time to do that. And that's what people often expect, to be super motivated, to sit here, do something that's hard and lose weight really, really quickly. Not going to happen. The people that lose weight and are sustainable, sit down here, do the easy things consistently because they know that motivation will be higher and it'll be easier to do. But sometimes it dips and it's about being consistent that matters. Another thing you can do to work with your emotional elephant is reduce decision fatigue. So you know that your rider is going to get tired after long days. So the last thing you want to think when you're tired and stressed from work is, what am I going to cook tonight? Or it's easy to, when you're on the way home, think, oh, I'll just grab a pizza or I'll just, you know, get a takeaway from a delivery or something. So we really want our plates to look like this, like we said, but that's not always very easy. If you went to the supermarket and tried to get a plate that looked like this, you'd have to do some thinking. And so the easiest way to reduce the amount of thinking you need to do is to use prep meals. Some people would stick their noses up at prep meals, but the reality is if you can, if you're going to pay a little bit more, but if it means that you don't have to think and you're going to get vegetables, good amount of protein and fiber and nutrition, then that is the easiest thing you can do to self-organize your nutrition and reduce your risk of overeating treats, which would be the extra portion sizes you don't need. You can also calorie control it because you know how many calories are in that meal and it's really easy to uh, to keep yourself on the straight and narrow. Another option you could use is semi-prepared meals. So with Gusto or HelloFresh, you can go onto the app, you can make sure the meals are under a certain calorie allowance so you're not overeating. And then you just select the meals you want, they deliver it to your door, and then you've got the exact ingredients to cook. So you don't have to think each day about what you're going to eat. But the most economical but also the most the hardest one to do is to plan and prepare your nutrition every week so these are the only three options really if you're gonna if you're gonna sustain a healthy lifestyle planning and preparing your nutrition is is a necessity whether you use the prepared options or or you do it all yourself but you need to think about the energy of the food that you're eating the portion sizes and make sure it looks like that health by science plate that it's got a good amount of protein and good amount of, of vegetables as well and that's the easiest way to, to train your elephant is just accept that your rider is going to get tired and you want to pick those small habits one at a time um, so that they work in your favor and you can, you can slowly change those behaviors. And the final one is to shape the path that your rider and your elephant go on. So if you walk down the street, you're going to see one of these or oh, in, anywhere in town anyway. They're everywhere. And they're huge chains because they're very good at um, consistently producing food that tastes great, you know, and um, they're convenient, they taste great, and um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very affordable for, for a lot of people. And so when we look at your environment, there's, we can break it down into kind of four areas. And it's, this is like the base of the, of the iceberg that you won't really think about, but probably the, one of the most powerful aspects. You've got your social environment. That's like the people you know, the people you hang out with. If you've got friends that always like to drink alcohol, you're more likely to drink alcohol. Um, it could be your cultural environment, the cultural rules and expectations. Again, um, that might be, you know, snacking in front of the TV is just considered a, a norm. When you go out with friends for, for dinner, you might get, or for work, you, you might get a funny look if you don't have uh, an alcoholic drink. You know, that's a quite a strong cultural, um, uh, quite a cultural 
pattern we have with in, in, in Scotland is alcohol. It's social. And when you don't do it, it's, you know, it often surprises people. You've got your intellectual environments. So this is Facebook, Instagram, when you, when you on BBC News or whatever news outlet you use, where are you getting your ideas and beliefs from? So when you see those adverts and ridiculous weight loss um, techniques, you know, that might um, give you false expectations, which make you more likely to fail. So you need to be very careful about where we get our information from. Um, whoops. And your physical environment. So <clears throat> do you live near a McDonald's or do you live near a Greg's? Do you live near a good takeaway? If you live near places that, that have very convenient access to, to treats, then you're more likely to, to eat the treats. It's, it's pretty, pretty simple when we think about it. There are also really common um, behaviors that, that, that we see uh, in people in general. And one of them is that we eat more from bigger dishes than smaller ones. And if the bowl is endlessly refilled, we just keep tucking in. We eat more from snack dishes that are close to us than dishes that are a few meters away. So if there's crisps on the table and you have to get up to eat them, you're more likely to eat less. And it's little things like that, again, that can make quite a big difference. We often pace our eating speed with other people. So if we eat fast, um, so if we eat with fast, hearty eaters, then, then we're more likely to eat quite fast as well. So if you're a parent, thinking about how you eat in front of your kids is very, very powerful because they will be copying what you're doing. And so by eating slower, um, you can actually help them um, manage their energy and take a lot more effectively too. We'll eat until the dish package or container is empty. So again, thinking about the size of the dish you're using is key, but we all, always generally eat till it's empty. And when we're watching TV, if you're eating in front of the TV, we eat nearly a third more food while watching 60 minutes of TV compared to watching 30 minutes of TV. So eating in front of the TV is very dangerous unless you've controlled the size of your dish and once it's gone, it's gone. These are all techniques we can we can use. So what are ten other techniques that we can use to manage our treats a bit better? Well, one is if, if you're going shopping, always write a shopping list. Supermarkets are extremely clever at um, influencing our behavior and what we buy. And if you write a shopping list before you go, by all means, put some treats on there, but be quite you know precise about what you're gonna do. Then that will help you stay on the straight and narrow. Another thing we can do is just ask yourself the question, can you reduce the number of treats that you have in the house? Now this might make people feel uncomfortable because we like treats, they make us feel good. And by asking you to take that away, kind of asking you to make yourself feel bad. But all I would say is think about it a bit more because treats are everywhere. So we're not saying you shouldn't have treats. What we're saying is, can we manage them a bit better and make them count? So, for example, if you like to get a takeaway on a Friday, maybe you don't need a packet of crisps every single day. You know, which would you rather? That bank balance analogy can be very useful here because you're never going to not have treats unless you lock yourself in a cave because they are everywhere. It's just about thinking of the environments that you can control. Can you make it easier for yourself? And one of the things you can do is do a complete kitchen makeover and just think about is your kitchen, is your home environment set up to make it easy for you to eat as healthy as possible? Now, again, that doesn't mean you don't have treats in the house. It's just about being very conscious of the treats that you have in the house. Make sure that you don't have too many that are going to mean you overeat because that is the one environment that you have a lot of control over. So it's the best place to start. Another thing you can do is do your food shop online. So we know that supermarkets set up their, the supermarket to steer you around the supermarket in a way that means you buy as much as possible and, and buy treats. There's a reason they have the bakery open as soon as you walk in, and you can smell the great um, bakery, tastes awesome, immediately makes you think, God, I bet that tastes good. That, that's not an accident. Doing your food shop online actually, uh, can, can take away a lot of those triggers and make it easier for you not to uh, experience those, those cravings. You could try carrying a nutritious snack with you, <clears throat> such as fruit, yogurt, nuts, or, or a protein bar. Uh, you could bring in your own 
uh, nutrient dense treats into work. So that might be again like your own uh, granola bar, or your own type of protein bar, or your own fruit and yogurt. Bring them into work so you don't feel like you're missing out, but you may be um, not choosing to have as many treats uh, as there might be normally. And ultimately, obviously, before doing a kitchen makeover means don't fill your kitchen with lots of energy dense processed carbs and fats, such as crisps and chocolate. Now, notice it says don't fill your kitchen. So it's fine to have some, but just be mindful of the amount that you have. And if you're struggling to lose weight, struggling to manage your treats, this is the first place to look. You're going to have treats, but just be selective about where you get them from. You could also have homemade ready meals in the freezer when you don't have time or energy to cook. So these could be bought from supermarkets, have ready meals good to go. Um, or you could make extra portions for yourself, like a bolognese or a chili con carne, put them in the freezer. So when you um, don't have time or you don't have energy or you're not organized, you've got a ready-made meal there that you, that you can go to. And just means that you're, you're a lot less likely to want to get a takeaway or a delivery. Because we want our plates to look like this as much as possible so it is as simple as that <laughs> there's a lot to take in guys um does anybody have whoops any questions <laughs> i'll breathe let's see alex this is where alex would normally chat away but uh I'm going, I'm going for an hour alone. So is that any, um, I think of a question, what we'll do, we'll move on to the next question, my controversial questions. Um, based on what we know about treats and um, think about that elephant rider environment, if you're a support practitioner, work with people supported, fizzy drinks is the feedback we've been getting is the fizzy drinks are and, and treats in general are very difficult to try and don't want to say control that's the wrong word they're hard to help manage because they're you know how do you get around that so i'm just going to take one extreme side of the argument should we ban them should we ban all um i know we can't and that's not allowed and it's highly illegal but should you um ban people supported from eating treats if you want to help uh, improve their nutrition what are your thoughts, Susan Bruce? I'm going to pick on you, sorry. I, I think it would be very difficult to, to ban them, and I wouldn't want to do that because it's people's choice whether they want to be healthy or not. But I suppose having a chat, if, if, if we've got people with support that perhaps um, they have got quite an unhealthy diet, then we're armed with information now. I quite like the analogies that you use. So we, so we definitely can encourage people to, to eat a bit better. Um, I'm probably a disaster to speak to at the minute because um, I recently have lost a lot of weight because I was diabetic and I didn't realise. So for the first time in my life, I haven't got any crisps, sweets, nothing like that I'm even limited to fruit I can have because of the sugar content so I've got quite a lot of information myself now ah, right. like to be able to pass on to people and hopefully um I am doing great but um it's not been through choice I realized how hard it is for people like not to have snacks or as you say get a pizza on the way home or or have crisps at home all of these things I've had to my weight issues it's probably my whole of my adult life so um I don't know Matt it's a wee bit different for me because I've been forced into this position but I have to say I'm quite enjoying it I'm no missing chocolate I'm no missing fizzy juice or anything like that and you can only really tell people your own experience but like I say we're armed with some information now so it'd be mm. quite helpful I think the online shopping definitely helps yeah Mm -hmm. that's amazing so i didn't um i had no idea you were going to give such an awesome re response that is like unbelievable that you've done done that because it's not easy but and it's amazing that you had diabetes you didn't even know mm -hmm. you know it's one isn't it about we're accidentally no you didn't intentionally obviously do that it's a bit, uh, probably a bit of a shock um 
sometimes that's quite useful to kind of that that motivation ability graph it kind of your motivation probably went through the roof you're like whoa i don't want this mm -hmm. um so you're able to do something that is probably quite hard for most people is that fair to say that your, your motivation went up when you found out uh, I forced motivation probably I mean do it or die it's as simple as that so I <laughs> but now that I'm because that, that's been three nearly four weeks now so I'm really into the habit of like brown bread wholemeal pasta brown rice that sort of stuff and I've saved an absolute fortune on my food shops I have to say so yes. I think that motivates me as well to think that I'm not wasting money or um, and I do, I do feel much better because I've lost weight. So I definitely. Brilliant, brilliant. I think um, it's it's interesting how you say like you, know, you feel better now, but it, you need to wait, don't you, to consistently yep. do it. Then you feel better, and then uh, then you reinforces it. Where, the, but that delay in the reinforcement is what people struggle with. When you go and get a chocolate, the reinforcement is immediate. You get mm -hmm. it. And that is very, um, very diff you know, difficult. That's why a lot of gambling is the same sort of thing with young people. We know that gambling problems have gone through the roof and better food, like their apps are so easy to use and so very good at getting that dopamine hit. It's the same, this is that, and, and like I said, the social media. So the same sort of things, it's, it's really fascinating and we don't have to ban them all i think we just need to understand how our brains work a little bit and we can start to kind of accept it and, and manage it better mm -hmm. so well done that's that's amazing you put, uh, thank you <laughs> cool <laughs> i'll answer that personally nope. Nope. um the other thing i was going to say Susan, is like you said that you don't miss them anymore and the the other important thing to mention that i didn't in that talk is that your taste is like plastic like our taste does change so when we really have these strong cravings they they change and, and they do go away and it, it just takes a bit of time for that to happen um they've made a really good point synthetic sweeteners um i'm gonna be blunt to the point good S synthetic sweeteners have there you go on social media you're gonna find some absolute loonies but uh, and you know you'll dig out any rat study and you can show it so it shows anything so there is a rat study that found that sweet is a bad food but you can't just extrapolate rat studies to humans and when you look at the amount they were given these rats that caused um neurological issues it would be equivalent of like 10 liters of diet coke a day so i mean people will say well you know even just a little bit no like sweeteners have been researched a hell of a lot more than probably most areas of nutrition because it's quite easy to to control in that way they some people say they increase risk of weight gain they, they don't um so could you say that sweeteners are it's better to have not have sweeteners and sweeteners yeah probably yeah that's i wouldn't dispute it's better not to have sweeteners but when it comes to diet coke versus coke it's an absolute no-brainer and i think it's probably one of the easiest things we could try and do with the people supported who are having fizzy drinks is to try and push them onto a diet version because you could smash you could slash their calorie intake by like a thousand if they're having a, a, a two liter bowl so yeah i think that um that's a really one with clear message sweeteners are better than sugar uh no sweeteners are probably better than than sweeteners but i I, I, yeah, there, there is certainly not an, nothing to suggest they're, they're, they're bound for you. Uh, that answers the question. <laughs> cool. That Kara said, I'm always scared in case I get obsessed with what food I have, etc. Do you mind elaborating on that a bit, Kara? Do you mean um, you don't like focusing on food because then you're um, obsessed with it? Or... Hi, Stuart. Hey. 
Can you hear me? I can't see anybody else's chat. It's just my question I've put in, which is a bit strange, but I'm using a laptop today. But anyway, well well done, Susan. Um, what I wanted to say was I never really had a problem like growing up with food. I was always quite active in that. And it's not until I've went into my 30s now and then lockdown and motivation is just at a low and I'm trying to get on my feet again. So I had been trying to do like a food diary and I was, I'm quite an addictive person personality if I like something I'm too scared to calorie count or something like that in case it becomes obsessive and I'm a bit scared to think I'm going into the supermarket checking everything what's in this um I've not done it yet but I've not done it for that reason thinking oh god I don't want like my mum's constantly at me going um just have you checked what's in that are you doing this are you like do that kind of thing if you know what I mean yeah yeah, that's a good point. And I think, yeah, that I, I should... I don't start. want it to become a problem. Um, yeah. And it can either go, do you know what I mean, a way that you're not wanting it to be... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, um, no, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. Really, you can. I would say the it's a really good point that, you know, I said that people that self-monitor do tend to do better, but that doesn't mean you should self-monitor, like, all the time. That, yeah, that, that could be um, sending the wrong message because you can, people do become obsessed with um, calories in my fitness plan. That can lead to eating disorders uh, or, you know, it's a spectrum of eating disorders. So it can lead you to, to being a bit more extreme than you need to be. So I think the way we like to look at it is it's a bit like a, a dimming switch. You turn it up sometimes, you turn it down again. So um, I think this is where we, you know, focus on the good stuff, not the bad stuff. Is for if you're quite obsessive, you want to think about your vegetables and your protein intake and make sure you're getting lots of that stuff. So you're not kind of obsessing over the um, the stuff you shouldn't have. Um, that's always a, a, a good place to start, uh, would be my and whenever we track nutrition, we don't we do we don't judge. So it's just a let's just track it and see what happens. Now that's very difficult if you're using my fitness pal because it will, it will throw in green and red colors and um, when you put in your targets. And I, I don't think that's always very helpful. I think they should say, you, they should let you get rid of that because inevitably you're going to start thinking red's bad. I'm being bad. And you cut, that's how it can trigger obsessive behaviors. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Looking at that, the the colours of the the fat, the sugar, the salt, and you're looking at something going red, right? Oh no, I can't have that. Do you know what I mean? And it's like yeah. it takes so much time, doesn't it? And um, it's about having a bit of balance and control. And um, I'm hoping to get somewhere a bit better than I am just now. Um, with all that, trying to get to where I want to be. Yeah. If I was um, if I was going to give you one piece of advice, I would I would try the mindful eating because with that, what it's doing is it, it you can train yourself to understand are you actually hungry? Because the problem is not should you eat it, is it bad, is it good or bad? The, the the reason this is so difficult is because it's well, do I need it or not? And the problem is you don't need any treats, but but we should you kind of do socially, so. By doing mindful eating, what it will do, it allows you to ride those crave waves. So when you crave that chocolate, you mean, should I have it, shouldn't I? You might think, well, I'm just going to ride this out and be aware of it. So it's about it's about being aware of what you're doing and just riding it and, and thinking, why am I hungry? Am I actually hungry or am I bored? Am I, am I actually hungry or am I depressed or a bit sad? And it's fine to be depressed and eat, but it's being aware of it. It's quite powerful and not just being a kind of just mindlessly going with it and wondering why am I, uh, why am I struggling? So that would be my advice because you're not then taking numbers, but you're still mindfulness is extremely powerful and good for a lot of things. And so anyone that has that strong emotions with this stuff, I would always say mindfulness is a really good tool for that. For people that don't get as emotional, and it's fine either way, it doesn't it's not good or bad. But people that just like a bit more black and white, do this, do that. Tracking can be quite good and quite easy because the mindfulness is um, not as accessible. But that Go Eat Right Now platform is is really powerful. It's like I think it's like fifteen quid a 
a month um, and it lasts for six weeks and then you you know you can dip in and out so hopefully that helps but I would that'd be my recommendation yeah I was trying to do it obviously on the free that I was trying to get a journal and do it myself and write it down everything that I was having that day and it would last for maybe about a week and then I lost the motivation going oh and I never went back to it and then that goes on for a couple of weeks to going back to normal to then going oh I should really be doing this again <laughs> do you know what I mean so maybe I'm having to invest in something like what you're saying to help um which mindfulness as well I think that is that's a great thing to think do I actually need it no why am I feeling like that maybe I'm feeling a bit low or sad maybe I'm thinking that chocolate bar is going to help me well it's really not <laughs> yeah that's, that's great yeah, yeah I think having that accountability is is key and, and we, yeah we will um I'll send you information on the the, the accountability academy if you want that yeah. mm -hmm. yeah just remembering and having this knowledge in your brain to keep um, self-evaluating yourself eh? just remembering 100%. You that, yeah. check in, you that that ankle when someone's going to ask you, you you're going to care a lot more when you rely on you yeah you, yourself, you know we 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 justify it oh well i was busy and stuff and that's fine but it's again it's just working with it having a better relationship with myself <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like rather than looking after everybody else, my daughter's got a great um nutritional like she's she's doing all exercise, she's got great um food intake. I'm always checking on what she's doing, but I'm at the backlog and it shouldn't be like that. Yeah, very easy for me to say. Very easy, but put your own oxygen mask on first. It's yeah. Flip away comment, but it's just kind of um I know. It's hard. It's a hard kind of uh, pill to swallow. But um, I, I guess maybe think about being a role model. Like again, just the eating slowly. One I think is quite good because you're gonna. Mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, I like that. It isn't about you. It's about them because they're learning mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. That again can kind of flip the, yeah. you know, using yourself as the kind of um, mm -hmm. as the reason to to do better better things because yeah. you are, you know going to be selfless when it comes to your family you're going to put them first so you can... even in work as well do you know what i mean you're you're bringing in healthy snacks and people are going oh god because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people do bring in fizzy juice and they're bringing in crisps and you, you have a look to see what they've got and you're bringing in a salad and could maybe yeah. motivate them do it together do you know what i mean like definitely i think there's a lot of place for that i think again about that's a really good point Claire, uh, Claire in the Highlands did that with her personal support where she started bringing in smoothies to try and promote the person she was supporting to eat more fruit and that actually helped her a lot you know but it wasn't about her she wasn't doing it for her but then it had a it was a nice side effect yeah and, and you're right your environment like we don't realize it when you go out meet your friends I always had to say this with clients imagine a social scenario where you meet more than two adults outside of your home that doesn't involve Oh, sorry, outside of work, outside of your home, that doesn't involve alcohol, unless you're you two tail. It's actually very rare that that wouldn't happen. Um, for a lot of people, it's so. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying how these things, these cultural things, um, that, that happen automatically. Just being being aware of them and saying, well, I like having a glass of wine, my friend, on a Saturday afternoon or evening. Therefore, I'm not going to have the packet of crisps after dinner on a Wednesday. Little that that sounds very easy, but actually it's little things like that that, that, that can go a long way. Um Daniel saying, what's your opinion to treat craving listing? What's that? Sorry, Daniel? Just last question. I don't know how to explain it. So <clears throat> previously, and me and my partner have done this, not so successful through lockdown, is that when we we would set an evening, usually a Friday night where we would maybe budge a bit, but during the week, if we got cravings for, say, it's a pizza or a chippy, or we'd write it down and revisit on Friday, and we found that was effective after a while. And usually, it gets to Friday, your list's this big, you're not going to eat all that, so you usually pick one. But it means the rest of the week, you didn't eat that stuff. And it proved quite fruitful for us for a while. Yeah, I must admit, I've not heard of that, but I like it because you're almost saying, I'm going to have it. I'm just going to wait. You got delayed gratification. You're not saying, I'm not going to have it. But then by the time it actually comes around, you might think, well, actually, I don't care for it i want to go for a, something else i think yeah that's that's really interesting i think if it if it works great yeah that's, that's i think something's going to used to get to a friday we'd look at that list and go don't fancy any of that what's in the freezer 
Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, people talk about cheat meals at the weekend. I, I hate the word cheat meals. You're not cheating. You're just accepting when you like to live a little more. That's what, that's what a cheat meal is. You're just living when, you know, and just accepting, well, if you know the weekends are going to be social, great. I really enjoy it. Um, be mindful and you do it. You'll enjoy it more. And just understand, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to really enjoy that. And I'm going to not do these other things to because I want to do that. And to make that decision, I think that's where the, the power of it comes from. Um, awesome, guys. Really, I appreciate you all probably uh, late for another virtual meeting somewhere. So um, we'll, we'll finish things there. But big topic. Really enjoy that one. Um, probably giving you more questions than answers. Apologies for that. But good, good topic nonetheless. And um, we'll catch up with you all in a couple of weeks time any questions always fire it over and i'll speak to you all soon thanks Stuart. So, yeah thanks bye